So uh, thank you very much, Nicoline. In my talk, I will be covering the role of biomarkers uh, in drug development. I'll start by talking about the different types of biomarkers, then talk about the process of developing biomarkers, and then devote the rest of my talk to um, particular biomarkers that serve as surrogate endpoints for clinical trials for approval. So there are many different types of biomarkers and many different uses. To provide a harmonized um, terminology for these biomarkers, um, the FDA worked with the NIH and the Biomarker Working Group to develop something called the BEST resource. Um, as you can, you can see, the acronym uh, spells out on the top. <clears throat> this resource um, provides a glossary of terminology uh, for the different uses of biomarkers, and it's available on the NIH website shown here. So let's start with the definition of a biomarker. Biomarkers is a defined characteristic that's measured as an indicator of normal biologic processes, pathologic responses, or responses to an exposure or intervention, including therapeutic intervention. Molecular, histologic, radiographic, or physiologic characteristics are different types of biomarkers. Some of the different types of biomarkers are shown on this slide. Uh, the ones on the top are a uh, category that represent measures of disease presence and disease status. And the ones lower down serve different purposes. Um, they don't necessarily measure disease uh, presence or status. Instead, they measure um, aspects of response to treatment. At FDA, we think carefully about how biomarkers will be used in clinical development. We look at their utility, particularly uh, in uh, regard to the context of use, or COU. The COU includes the bio best biomarker category that the biomarker represents, and the way the biomarker is going to be used in the clinical trial or drug development program. A number of different potential contexts of use are shown uh, in the um, bullets below. In green is uh, the one that requires the highest level of evidence. Um, this is a biomarker that's used as a surrogate for regulatory approval, either using traditional approval or, as we've heard about before, accelerated approval. Different levels, different biomarkers require different levels of evidence, and the evidence required falls into two categories. Analytic validation, which involves uh, demonstrating the reliability of an assay, um, its precision, and also uh, a, a demonstration that the assay measures what it purports to measure. Separate from that is clinical validation. This is the process where you learn how a biomarker relates to a clinical concept of interest. There are a number of different ways to develop biomarkers. Uh, we have um, formed a uh, process um, for biomarker qualification within the FDA. That's a transparent public process uh, where, uh, upon qualification, the biomarkers are available to anyone for use. There are other processes for developing biomarkers. Some have come to be used just based on scientific community consensus. And others are developed based on data provided by pharmaceutical sponsors in the process of developing their particular therapeutics, uh, shown on top, uh, drug approval process. And these are not mutually exclusive, of course. The process for biomarker qualification is shown on this slide. It begins with a letter of intent submitted by the group that's developing a biomarker. Then um, they specify how they're going to analyze the data and collect the data for qualification. Then they submit the analysis they've done. And if it uh, demonstrates uh, validity for the context of use, then it will be uh, qualified. And this process has been codified in legislation, the 21st Century Cures legislation. One particular type of biomarker is the surrogate uh, biomarker or surrogate endpoint. They can be used for uh, approval, either using traditional approval or accelerated approval. But it's important to appreciate that to support approval, FDA requires substantial evidence of effectiveness. And this means showing that the drug improves a clinically meaningful outcome. 
namely a way that a patient feels, functions, or survives. In the case of validated surrogate endpoints, there's strong and diverse evidence that the biomarker predicts a particular clinical outcome, and therefore it can be used for traditional approval. In other situations, there's good evidence to indicate that the biomarker is likely to predict uh, clinical benefit, but it's not as certain as for a validated surrogate. Here, it's uh, considered reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, and this may provide the basis for an accelerated approval. So it's important to recognize that there are uh, limitations to the use of surrogate endpoints. Um, they can be fallible. Some, they are not a direct measure of the way a patient feels, functions, or survives. Instead, they're intended to reflect and predict clinical benefit that's not measured um, by the biomarker itself. With the surrogate endpoint, the benefit risk assessment, therefore, has to be based on assumptions and predictions of benefit and not on observed benefit. And in some situations, biomarkers may actually fail to predict clinical benefit. And that's shown um, in these uh, figures on this slide. Uh, in some situations, the biomarker is on the critical, on the um, causal pathway uh, between disease and clinical outcome. And then when the drug impacts the biomarker, it will also be expected to uh, impact the clinical outcome. In other situations, the biomarker is not on the causal pathway, but may correlate with clinical outcome. In this case, a drug may have an effect on the biomarker, but have no effect on the clinical outcome. Finally, in some situations, the biomarker actually is on the causal pathway, but other effects of the drug, adverse effects, can lead to toxicity and lead to a negative benefit risk association. I want to provide an example of clinical validation of a biomarker, and I'd like to um, present some data um, that's uh, available from radiographic progression in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, X-ray progression in rheumatoid arthritis is based on uh, assessing the accumulation of erosions in joints, and loss of uh, joint space width. And in the graph on the left, you can see in a number of different epidemiologic cohorts that radiographic progression, uh, as measured by standardized uh, instruments, increases in a linear manner in groups of patients over time. In contrast, on the right in those two graphs are seen uh, disability, which is expected to correspond to damage to joints. But what you can see in the graph on the top right, early on, uh, disability, as measured by the HACC or Health Assessment Questionnaire, does not increase over time. It's only later on that it begins to increase in a more linear-looking way. And uh, in contrast, in established RA, once it is established in the um, right lower panel, uh, you can see progressive increase in uh, disability over time. This can be appreciated in one particular cohort, the Truro cohort, where you can look at um, disability in the black circles uh, on the left. And what you, you can see is in the first two years, there is no increase in um, uh, disability. But then after two years, uh, the disability increased over time. In contrast, radiographic changes, as shown in the open circles, uh, increased progressively over the whole course of the study. Uh, up to uh, five years. And the correlation between radiographic damage and disability, as shown in the bars, uh, was quite variable and was low early on in follow-up, only became strong after five years of uh, follow-up. So this illustrates that to demonstrate the, um, the correlation, the um, uh, association between the biomarker and a relevant clinical outcome could take many years uh, of study. So different surrogate endpoints uh, have different levels of supportive evidence. In the case of uh, a validated surrogate endpoint, there's a high level of evidence, and this can be the basis for traditional approval, for example, serum uric acid for gout. In contrast, candidate surrogate endpoints have some evidence uh, linking them to clinical uh, benefit, uh, but the evidence is low, and these aren't appropriate for regulatory decision-making. In between are 
uh, measures where there is some good evidence um, to indicate a correspondence to clinical benefit, but not quite enough uh, to be a validated surrogate. And these are the situations where you could use accelerated approval. FDA doesn't just look at benefit for approving products, of course. It also looks at risk and looks to see a positive benefit-risk relationship. For accelerated approval, when efficacy is established via the effect on the surrogate endpoint, where there's unquantifiable clinical benefit, the risk-benefit assessment must balance an unmeasured clinical benefit against measured risk. So for accelerated approval, um, this can be used for serious and or life-threatening conditions. The endpoint is often a surrogate endpoint that's considered reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. As has been mentioned before, it requires a post-marketing study to confirm that the uh, therapeutic agent actually does confer a clinical benefit. And there are pluses and minuses to accelerated approval. One plus is that it allows faster access to promising treatments, but a minus is that patients may be exposed to the risk of a drug that in the end does not show a uh, clear benefit. There's also the potential for less safety information and a confirmatory trial may not be completed in a timely manner. So I'll leave you with a couple of uh, considerations for um, uh, uh, the use of uh, surrogate endpoints in osteoarthritis, you need to be very sure about what is the clinical benefit that's expected with this particular surrogate. You need to know how strong the scientific evidence is, tying the biomarker to clinical outcomes, and we need to have a good understanding of how much change in the biomarker would indicate a clinic clinically meaningful benefit for patients. Thank you.